And with the election of Barack Obama, uh, there is supposedly you know, an expectation that antitrust enforcement will make a comeback. You alluded to that uh, a fair amount on, on the previous panel. Uh, you know, what kind of things do you see happening right now or do you foresee on the horizon that, uh, that indicate that's true? And, uh, and how do you think that will play out for clients? Well, we have the, the somewhat unusual situation where President Obama, when he was a candidate, really campaigned it in small part on increasing antitrust enforcement. And there aren't a whole lot of presidential campaigns where that's a big issue. But uh, I don't know if it rose to the level of a big issue, but it was, it was surprising to see him spend any time on it. So not surprisingly, new leadership that he's brought in to both the antitrust division and then the, the new chairman of the Federal Trade Commission are certainly committed to showing that antitrust enforcement is becoming more aggressive. So number one, they need to change, as I mentioned earlier, the public perception. There haven't been a large number of deals so far for them to actually show that the, the talk has translated into action, but I think we can, we've already seen some indications of that. Particularly at the Federal Trade Commission, we've seen um, a, a very active last year um, in, in antitrust enforcement on the M&A side. Although with the, with the FTC, you really do have to put a little footnote and say that, that trend probably started a couple of years ago. And I wouldn't necessarily attribute it um, in significant part to the um, Obama administration as much as just the the um, makeup of the commission right now. I think where we, where we have seen concrete examples of increased antitrust enforcement has, has largely been on small deals. And we've, there have been a number of challenges, particularly at the Federal Trade Commission, of relatively small deals, which uh, has to be frustrating for those of you who are involved in in smaller deals where um, bluntly the expenses really do matter, unlike a, you know, a, a, a uh, tens of billion dollar of deal where um, to some extent the, for example, the antitrust expense can get lost a little bit in the, in the avalanche of other expenses. On the little deal, it obviously, um, every dollar spent counts. And unfortunately, the antitrust review does not correlate, or the level of the antitrust review, does not correlate to the amount of money or value of the transaction. And therefore, you can see several examples at the FTC over the past couple of years where you have modest-sized deals that have received a tremendous amount of scrutiny, indeed, and in some of the instances have been challenged. And that goes so far as even with deals that are not, were not Hart Scott Redina reportable, and were consummated transactions, and the government came back after the fact and challenged those transactions, reviewed and challenged those transactions. You know, the, I'm sorry, the, the, cost, the cost issue that you described, it really also applies across the sort of valuation space around financial reporting. The new um, accounting standards for M&A, it's called FAS 141R, there's a lot more fair value measurement that goes into that. And, a lot of deal aspects that you might see in smaller to mid-sized deals, uh, contingent payouts, for example, the mechanics of figuring out how to actually account for those is, is gotten much more complicated. And so what you get is a similar, potential similar issue that not only is, are the, the, the antitrust regulators adding to the cost of, of these getting these deals done, but some of the surrounding accounting, valuation, financial reporting work that has to get done in order to get these deals done sort of relative to a, a larger deal is also um, going up. You compound that with the fact that the other piece of the new accounting standards is that any deal costs get immediately expensed. And so rather than spreading these costs over you know, some, some indefinite period of time, um, now the accounting model says they go away day one. So you can really create uh, you know, some, real, some real expense pressures as you get into these small and mid-sized deals. Talking about uh, M&A accounting, uh, my understanding is there are sort of two areas where uh, FASB is uh, rethinking uh, how, uh, how to carry that out. Uh, 141, as you mentioned, and there's another uh, uh, FASB 160, which sort of deals with just changes in non-controlling interest. Can you sort of right. walk through um, the current state of those regs and um, where it looks like FASB is heading? Well, I guess those, those um, new standards are in place. Um, and 
you know, they're, they're for the moment at least here to stay, they were, the, the FES 160 um, is a little bit of an accounting geeks kind of thing. It's sort of, you know, do, how do you account for minority interests? How do you account for transactions with shareholders? And um, sort of the easiest way to explain it is that um, in the old days, the financial statements were put together for the, for the use of, if you will, the majority shareholders. If there was a non-controlling, a minority interest, it's called, that was considered not part of shareholders' equity and was considered outside shareholders' equity, so any transactions with those shareholders were considered um, acquisitions of minority interest or sales creating the gain. The new standards basically say any transaction with any shareholder for any reason is treasury stock. Um, and so it's just, it, it's created some differences in the way the financial statements look. It's created some differences in the way you account for transactions with shareholders, probably most significantly. Um, FES 141R, which is the predecessor, or I'm sorry, successor to FES 141, the biggest single issue there is that um, f accounting for business combinations is now completely on a fair value basis. Everything in the balance sheet, maybe with the exception of deferred taxes, is now accounted for at fair value. So a um, great example is uh, accounting for contingencies. Um, you know, back in, in the old standards, accounting for contingencies, you use the old FAS5 probability model, things like that. Uh, now in the standard, you have to actually have to figure out, gee, what's the fair value of that contingency? Um, earnouts, same kind of thing. You've got to try to figure out what the value for an earnout is. Um, which really brings you to using some co more complex modeling applications, Monte Carlo simulations, um, Black Scholes type models, in order to be able to really figure out how to account for business combinations. So the landscape has shifted quite a bit um, in terms of, of how business, uh, purchase accounting works. Um, it, it, as I said, it's more complicated than it used to be, um, and, and it can easily be, be more expensive for companies that are making acquisitions.